You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the show today. I've got a good one for you, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. But before we get into it, I want to tell you about the Aero Series pedal boards from Creation Music Company. The Aero Series are a unique take on the flat board. So they, you know, you know what a flat board looks like. It's basically a flat board. This is unique. It's raised up off the ground a little bit, so you can have a little room underneath your board for power supplies. A, more room on your board for pedals. They also have slots in the top, and it's not just willy-nilly slots just kind of thrown out wherever. They really took a lot of time to design the placement and size of these slots to be optimized for running different cables in and just as many different configurations as possible, all while remaining lightweight and compact, and also you can have your handles, your carrying handles, in different positions on some of the larger size models. But the Aero Series is awesome. It's all made in the USA, and they stand behind everything they do 100%. It's great, great stuff. Great pedal boards. Really, really simple, really aesthetically pleasing design. The Aero is really an awesome take on flat boards, and you'll be able to fit so much more stuff on it. It's kind of insane, even though it takes up just the same amount of space. So go check out the Aero series from Creation Music Company today at creationmusiccompany.com. We are also brought to you by the fine and wonderful and amazing folks over at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Gun Street Wiring Shop is the place to go for all of your guitar wiring needs. Let's say you've got some ratty old Tisco laying around and it's got just like a rat's nest in there and you're not sure what to make of it. It all just needs to go. Sean can help you with that can get you a configuration that will work excellently in just about any guitar that you can imagine. I've seen him tackle some big projects, and they always come out looking great, and the customer service is second to none. So if you're having any issues with your harness, trying to get it installed properly, or whatever your your issue might be, Sean can walk you through it, and he makes fantastic products. He's a fantastic guy, and I cannot recommend Gun Street Wiring Shop enough. I can't. I simply can't. Go to GunStreetWiringShop.com, check out their offerings. If you don't see exactly what you need, feel free to email him. He will make it happen, because that's what he does. So go slide over to GunStreetWiringShop.com today and check it out, because you need to. We are also brought to you by Stringjoy. Stringjoy Guitar Strings out of Nashville, Tennessee. Fantastic stuff. It's all I use anymore. I have for uh, quite a long time at this point. I've gotten really close to Scott over the years. I know him really well. And he, let me tell you, this guy knows more about strings and has put more thought into strings than I ever knew was possible to put into thinking about strings. I mean, the depths of the nerdery, you know, it it goes deep. And uh, it shows in the product. I think they're the best strings out there. They really sound and play excellent. As soon as I throw a new set on, I'm just like, oh man, these things really are great. What's even better? Ironclad guarantee. If you don't like them, you're like, Blake... I bought these, and they're not any good. Well, that's okay. You're not out anything because Stringjoy guarantees them. So if they're not for you or or you break one or whatever the case may be, they have an ironclad guarantee. Just email them, and they will make it right some way, somehow. So Stringjoy.com for the best guitar strings on the market made by real humans in Nashville, Tennessee. Check them out at Stringjoy.com. And last but not least, I want to give a little plug for Patreon. Patreon is where you can go if you need more tone mobbery in your life. If these weekly episodes just aren't enough to wet the whistle, you can go to patreon.com slash tone mob, and there are a whole bunch of other episodes over there for you. Over 40 at this point. So plenty of more hours of listening pleasure for your ears. It's all available at patreon.com slash tone mob for as little as $5 a month. $5 a month. You're going to get fresh episodes just like this one beamed right to your favorite podcast player 
And all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash tone mob and check it out. So yes, we've got hours and hours of extra listening over there for you, if that's your thing, including an extension of this very conversation. So once you get done listening to this episode, if you really enjoyed it, you can go over to Patreon and check out the rest of the conversation. Okay, all right, that's it for that stuff. So yeah, without further ado, I will get into this conversation that I've been wanting to have for a very, very long time with Mr. Analog Mike himself from Analog Man. All right, here you go. Boom. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob podcast, the show about guitar tone and people behind it. I'm your host, Blake Weiland, and with me today, I have none other than Mr. Analog Man himself, Mike Piera. What's happening, man? Good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. I'm really excited that this is uh, this is happening finally. I don't know if you know this or not, but you you definitely are up there with uh, most one of the most requested guests. So oh, no fantastic. pressure or anything. Glad to hear that because you know we we don't advertise and we don't do a lot of publicity, so a whole lot less people know about us than than most of the other companies. Well, you know, to the the those that care, the hyper nerds that are going to sit in and uh, listen to a show like this, they know all about uh, Analog Man, or at least they know about Analog Man in general. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so maybe a good place to start, because I again, you don't do this kind of stuff very often. Maybe a good place to start would be the classic, you know, musical backstory. How did you get into playing? How did it lead to, you know? analog man being the company that it is today and and your place in the industry sure well um i do come from a musical household my dad was a professional bass player um played uh, jazz and then through the 60s started going electric when you could no longer fit his uh, acoustic bass in the car easily and um and he started getting more into pop and rock and uh i learned how to play his bass in I think just about when Cream was coming out, because the first song he showed me was Sunshine of Your Love. I learned how to play that when I was, I guess, like eight, eight years old or whenever that came out. And um, he always supported me in my musical endeavors over the years. And did your dad, uh, did your dad encourage guitar, piano, or anything specific? Or did he just say... No, not piano? really. Yeah, anything. I mean, um, I always wanted... You know, just even when I was younger, when I was like four or five years old, you know, I, I would just try to apply to play music. So my parents always got me like toy organs. Everybody had my age would have the little Magnus chord organ. Everyone had those. And I would, I would learn to play all the songs by ear just on that thing. I figured out what chord to hold button to hold and what notes to play and played that. And then I would get better organs. And then my dad got a free piano, put that down in the basement and, Finally, when I got into into some bands in uh, in junior high school, um, I was lucky. My bandmate had a Hammond B three at his house, so that was fantastic. Oh, nice! But he wouldn't really let his my mom wouldn't let us take that out when we were playing like at the uh, the uh, talent shows. So my dad, who did tax accounting for a lot of the lo- local music stores, brought home a uh, Farfisa synth orchestra keyboard from one of the music stores for me. So that was a, that was a great start. Nice. Very cool. And, and uh, uh, when did, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I played keyboards in, in high school. And then when I got to college, there was a really good t- keyboard player there, but they needed a bass player. And you know, I had fooled around in bass and guitar too. And I could read music because I played trombone and basses in the same key at, or uh, bass clef. Um, so I auditioned for a bass player for the band and I got in. So I, I really enjoyed playing bass in college and also just, I went to a very competitive school, um, Rensselaer up in Troy, New York, uh, a bunch of engineering nerds up there. So it was really hard work. And I would just veg out with my uh, Hagstrom guitar or my acoustic. I picked up a Yamaha acoustic and it was just nice to get away and play a little music when I wasn't studying. So I got into guitar there. And then after, uh, after college, I continued playing a little keyboards. And then when I started Analog Man, I, you know, I, I would play guitar five minutes a day (laughs) for every day, but that wasn't enough to really get good. But I realized, you know, I had to really dig in a little more to, to really determine what, what pedals were, 
were needed and what sounded good and things. So I just played more and more and more. And I've been in a band now for the last decade or so, probably playing at least once a week with the band and trying to trying to get some gigs together again. Very cool. Very cool. What kind of music? We play classic rock up to up to some current rock. Um, you know, the, the Beatles and a little Zeppelin, Tom Petty. I, I'm, I'm actually a, a prog rock. Guy. I mean, that's the music I really love the most, Genesis and Pink Floyd and stuff. So I try to work a little of that in, but um, most people don't really want to listen to that. So I have to play, play you know, more, more common stuff. And we have a female vocalist now, so we're trying to work her into things. And I, I don't like a lot of songs, um, not a lot of prog music with female vocalists, but, you know, she can sing like Led Zeppelin and stuff, which no guys can actually usually sing. So nice, <laughs> nice for that. And the harmonies, you know, I, I like to do some Fleet, Fleetwood Mac and uh, Linda Ronstadt, stuff like that. It's all it's all good fun. Very cool. Very cool. And it's uh, local gigs. Are you guys traveling around a little bit? Yeah, no, we're just we're just pretty much local, um, mostly parties, weddings, stuff like that. But um, hopefully we'll get more organized. It's just everybody's busy like like I am. And it's hard to get everyone together and practice. And we we have like a hundred songs, which is ridiculous. I think what we really have to do is just narrow it down and say, okay, let's get 30 songs really down and then we can play anywhere we want. Yeah. Yeah. That hundred, I was just talking about this the other day as I, you know, trying to get our band back to practicing and playing a little bit more regularly. And I was just like, man, I don't remember how to play any of my parts on any of this stuff. You know, like this is going to be rough on songs that I helped write. Like, I don't even remember how they, you know, like, oh, this is going to be ugly for a little while, but we'll get right. through it, you know. Right. Yeah. Ugh. I remember in the old days, I would just, it would be so easy to memorize songs. I'd never even had anything written down. It was all in my head. But now, you know, I, I, I have the, my iPod as a crutch with on song on it and, I use it way too much. I really have to try to get away from it and try to try to use more of my head than just sitting there reading the music and words. But uh, it's tough to to get over that crutch. What the, what was that you were saying you use? We use a, a, an ampl- application called On Song. It's pretty popular. It has it scrolls. It has words. You can put chords on it. All kinds of annotations and. It has optional foot pedals and stuff, but I just basically use it to scroll with the words and chords and notes for myself. Like, like for example, at the beginning of each song, I'll, I'll have which pedals to use, um, any settings, what guitar to use, um, vocal settings. I have a, a vocal processor I use. Um, anything else, any hints like uh, tell the bass player he's singing the wrong harmony here or something like that. <laughs> so anything to help, I have all that in my on song uh, application. I'm going to have to look into that because what I have is a big binder full of paper. That's yeah, we used to have that. We would call it the P pile. We would, because, you know, we had the alphabetized indexes and everything would end up in the P in the P's for some reason. So it's like, well, where's, <laughs> where's band on the run? It's like, it's a B, but it's not, it, look in the P pile. <laughs> that was our big <laughs> joke. Everything was in the P pile. Ugh. That's where it always but, ends up. But now in the iPad, you just scroll down to B and there's band on the run. Okay, I got to get on the this on song stuff. They got I got some tablets laying around here that aren't being used, and it sounds there you like go. they they just found their new use. That's right. awesome. So backing up a little bit, you said you were in a fairly uh, competitive engineering school. Did that have right. anything to do with the birth of Analog Man? Um. Well, I mostly concentrated on software engineering. Um. Because I, I saw that that was where the the, the world of jobs was heading to. Um, and I, I guess that was right. Um, so I realized, you know, I don't like data processing. I don't like that kind of crap programming job. I, I, I'm an engineer. I want to get into something where you're, you know, deep into the computer or deep into calculations. So I got into a CAD CAM company. I developed CAD CAM programs, things like that, <clears throat> where I could use the software engineering, but not not for some data data garbage, which doesn't interest me. But And then after that, I worked for a company that actually manufactured transistor testing equipment in Japan. So I learned all about transistors and the parameters of testing them and how everything worked. And I got to go to Japan and work there quite a lot too, which is actually where I um, was turned on to vintage guitars was in, in Tokyo, Japan. <laughs> oh, really? Can you tell tell me that story? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I had always kind of liked guitars, and um, but when I went to Japan, I had a lot of time where I wasn't working, and I would walk around the city and I would find these um, vintage guitar shops in um, in the o- Ochanomizu area, Akihabara area. And they just had so many fantastic American guitars. The stores just smelled fantastic. And the other thing about, about them was the prices were fantastic. And I realized, oh, my God, these guitars are so much cheaper in the United States. So I came back here and I started buying vintage guitars and um, bringing them or, or sell, shipping them over there. Um, and I was actually doing it on consignment over there. So rather than just doubling my money, I would triple or quadruple my money on consignment. I found a new dealer there who didn't want to put all his uh, money in, into his stock. So he was very happy to take things on consignment. So uh, that, that was a very nice way to get into the, the guitar business and buying and selling guitars over here before they got really popular. This was the, um, I guess the early mid nineties or so. Okay. Yeah. That, is, that was an interesting time in the, guitar space for sure right of course this was all pre-internet so people would be selling a guitar in their local newspaper for what it went over a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars or whatever nobody really knew what these things were worth vintage guitar magazine was just coming out and you could pick it up at like barnes and noble but even that you know not not too many people knew about that either so i found out about that when i went to look at some guitars from the local rag and the guy who was selling them had had the vintage guitar magazine so so certainly I subscribed and started learning, learning all about the guitars. And uh, of course, from the guitars, it, it went into the pedals because as I went to buy guitars, I would find pedals and um, started buying and selling pedals. I kind of specialized in that in, in the mid nineties, there was about three or four pretty big vintage guitar dealers, uh, vintage guitar effects dealers back then. And um, I would run ads in vintage guitar magazine and, uh, of course, a lot of the pedals that would come in would, wouldn't be working right, so I'd have to fix them up, find parts, um, buy two or three pedals to make one good one. And uh, I, I was selling a lot of those in Japan, too, because back then Japan had all the money. They were really doing so well, and everyone over there was really interested in the old stuff. So a lot of my vintage effects sold to Japan. Actually, the guy who started Free the Tone, he's making a lot of great pedals now. He bought tons of pedals from me back before when he was just a a collector before he built anything neither of us were building anything back then oh wow that's (laughs) what a crazy small world that this is free the tone is a little bit of a little bit of a newer entrant into the pedal space as far as i'm aware not like super new but yeah they're a little little newer newer. but yeah he's making some really high-end kind of analog digitally controlled kind of delays and all kinds of other stuff very popular yeah, that very expensive. Really, really cool. <laughs> yes, very expensive, very complicated in a good way. Not like overcomplicated, but right. high high functioning, I guess we would call it. Right, right. Yeah, I had a couple of vintage guitar shops over there that would buy buy my pedals um in pretty, you know, they'd buy 10 or 20 vintage pedals at a time and I'd ship them over there and they'd resell them and uh that went that went pretty good for a while and then I would then I started um, selling online, uh, well, not online, but through the Vintage Guitar Magazine here too. We would run ads with the inventory in it, and um, that's kind of how I got started in pedals. Was as a vintage guitar effects dealer. Oh, okay. I did not know that. You didn't just hop right in to start building them. You were already were you already Analog Man by then, or was it something else? I actually was. I think I became Analog Man in like a 1993 or so when I needed a name for the. Uh, the classic American guitar show out, out in Dix Hills, Long Island, which was a really fun guitar show sponsored by uh, 20th Century Guitar Magazine, and they would have celebrity jams every every you know Saturday night, and got to meet a lot of the great players and hear them play. And I needed a name for that booth, and I just kind of thought that was funny. I don't know how I came up with it. I'm a big Rush fan, and Rush has the Digital Man or Analog Kid Digital Man song, so I kind of took a combination and became Analog Man. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. So Analog Man is looked at by a lot, especially a lot of the newer pedal companies, is kind of one of the 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 first, uh, I don't know if you even like this term, some people find it a little bit weird, but quote unquote boutique pedal manufacturers. Is that, uh, do you view it, view it the same way or do you have a different lens you view it through? 
Yeah, I, 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 I don't mind that um, because we are still, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> even though we're a little bigger, we're still really what the definition of the word boutique is. And when we, when we came out, um, G- George was still making way huge pedals and people don't realize he had a, he came out with a lot of pedals in a short time and he was even doing modifications. People don't realize he was doing modifications before anybody. Um, and he had a great range of pedals, which were basically, you know, l- like all of us, they were starting with classical, classic designs that people liked that you couldn't get anymore and making them with true bypass. Uh, his pedals were really high quality aluminum cases, really good circuit boards, used good parts. They sounded good. They worked great. And then there was full tone. Of course, he was make he was making just the full drive two back then, or the full drive one, um, which was you know basically a, a, a hot rodded tube screamer. And um, maybe prescription electronics was around. Unfortunately, they've they've gone out of business. But uh, his pedals are still still doing well and kicking butt on the on stages around the world. Yeah, and he's uh, he's still doing well and well, I guess as well as one can do in the used market i see prescription pop up a lot it could have something to do with miley being in portland and i believe Ah, he was as well so yes um i do seems to be a a decent amount of there we got a yeah we got a good a good little group of guys up here for sure um that's for sure so yeah that's kind of that was my viewpoint on at least the industry at that time too was uh, those were those were kind of the players and what do right. you we, like? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we actually, um, I think we started modifying tube screamers before we came out with our own analog man pedals. Because when I was in Japan, I, I found the, the chips. Um, we had, before we had the World Wide Web, um, we had Usenet and email. And Usenet would have like alt.guitar.effects Usenet. And we'd go on there and post, post questions and answers and things and uh lots of people were interested in tube screamers back then because eric johnson steve ray vaughn etc and everyone seemed to want the old ts 808s the ts9s had not even been reissued yet but i i had bought and sold several of those or dozens of those by then and found out all the differences and when i was in japan i picked up the the chips to uh convert the ts9s into the 808 and started offering that and um, I was just kind of surprised that people just started sending me their pedals and nobody really knew me at that time but people were like yeah do mine too and I would just do them like in my my break time at work or after work I'd be home on my uh, dining room table modifying pedals and putting my little stickers on and sending them back going to the post office on my lunch break and I did that for a while and then um decided you know we should make we should make some pedals and i think the first one i made which is a very strange pedal for a first pedal was our chorus analog man chorus pedal which is still going strong i love um, it nirvana. i have one. <laughs> oh, glad to hear that because nirvana was really really big back then and everyone wanted to get kurt sound and uh, the electroharmonic small clones and clone theories were were available used but they were expensive and they were never built well. So even if you found one, um, it probably wouldn't be gig worthy. So we came out with our version with some help from uh, Alfonso Hermida was helping me out and RG Keen, who's now with, uh, uh, I don't know what they're called anymore. It used to be Visual Sound, True Tone or something like that. And Hermida from, from the Zen Drive, they, we were all working together, making circuit boards and stuffing them up and coming we were reverse engineering ourselves because there was no Google. You couldn't just Google <laughs> right. small clone and find, you know, a DIY project and just build it and put your name on it. You had to actually reverse engineer it, find the parts that actually sounded good, test them, build it up. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work in making a boutique pedal in the nineties. Oh and, yeah. Uh, that, that got, got pretty popular. So we sold a lot of chorus pedals. Yeah, I I love it. It's actually one of my one of my favorite chorus. I got it as a gift a few years ago, and I uh, huh. I still use it, and I still think it's one of the best sounding choruses out there. So there you go. Glad to um, hear that. And it we just got actually I just built one today. I had my one of my guys build a bike chorus today for uh, Uli John Roth, who is a recent um, convert to the King of Tone. Uh, I saw him a couple of weeks ago, and he loved his King of Tone and. 
I heard his, his chorus sound wasn't that great. So I said, you know, you, you might want to upgrade your chorus too. And he said, get me a bi chorus. So we're shipping that over to him uh, tomorrow. Perfect. That's awesome. So, yeah. you know, I would be, I, I know you, you probably get tired of explaining this on, on various internet forums and, and whatever, but in your own words, you know, with your own voice, let's talk about the king of tone and <laughs> the whole world surrounding that thing. So how did that start? And, you know, what, what do you attribute to that thing? Just being the runaway success that it is. Well, it started because, um, Jim Weeder, who was playing with the band when I met him, um, before the unfortunately, fortunate death of, uh, of, um, uh, yeah. Bass player, <laughs> Danko, mm-hmm. Rick Danko. Um, he, he was just getting tired of his tube screener because um, it had a lot too much mid range, a little bit low end cut. You know, it, it did what you wanted. You could hear it in the band, but he was just getting tired of it. He wanted something a little different. So uh, he tried a few things. And um, <clears throat> a friend of ours, Mitch Colby, who now makes the Colby amps, and he was at Marshall at the time. Now he's making, actually, he's making my, uh, my Jimmy Page Dragon amp. I bought one of the 40 Dragon amps that he's building with new old stock parts. So Ooh. to get that pretty soon and um he t- he said mike you, you know you guys should try this old marshall blues breaker i've got one in my collection and they sound pretty good so he sent it up to us and we tried it and it definitely had some potential so i bought a few more of them so we could do a b tests between different different changes and um i made a few changes that sounded pretty good <clears throat> i sent sent one to my collaborator obayashi san in in japan he's out in hiroshima and he tried a few things. And he said, oh, Mike, you should try these diodes, try this chip. I tried them. Me and Jim tried them. We tweaked them more. And Jim said, you know, that, that sounds pretty good. So uh, we just started making them up. I, and I, I came up with the idea of um, giving, it the, giving it the boost knob because uh, make it a little more, more usable. So I gave it a second channel, which was basically, I think the second channel had a volume control on it and also you could change the modes. You could have it go from clean mode to overdrive mode, but it shared distortion, the drive knob, and it shared the tone knob. So it wasn't a huge difference, but um, the pedal sounded great. And that was like a version one, version two. And it's, it's so good that even guys like Mark Rebo, he's still using the version two. Um, he sent me his old version two about a month ago for like the fifth time he sent it back for, for switches and pots and stuff because he just uses it so much. And finally I said, you know, Mark, I, I, I've saved a couple of these version twos from, you know, 15 years ago. And why don't I just send you a new one? I'll, I'll keep your old one for my collection. And he signed it for me and I got that in my collection now. And he's, he's got a new old stock version two King of Tome that he's uh, using to this day. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, we just, we just, I just started shipping them and, I didn't really advertise them or anything, but, you know, people said, oh, you know, analog band's making an overdrive. Let's try it. And it just spread. And I didn't realize the market there was. I mean, there's a a larger market for overdrive than there is for a chorus or a compressor because almost everybody needs an overdrive pedal. So I just couldn't really make them fast enough. And we started getting waiting lists. And then I realized, well, I like the two-channel idea, but, the second channel, it doesn't do enough. I really want to have separate drive and tone knobs so we can have really two different sounds. Um, and when I tried switching that, it, it didn't work. And I just kind of got really busy and I just was unhappy with the way it was working. So I kind of stopped building them for a while and the list kept growing. And finally, I came out with the version two where I just came to me, well, why don't you just put two complete circuits in there rather than one circuit switching things? You know, it's not that much more expensive, and uh, that way you it's really two pedals in one box. They just share a power supply. Everything else is, is different, so you can have two different modes on the, the different sides, different gains, different tones, and uh, pretty much that version 4 that we came out with uh, is still the same one we're making to this day. And about how long ago was that, that the version 4 came out? Oh, uh, oof. I'm not, I have such a bad memory for dates, but, um, it was probably in the late two thousands. I'm thinking. Gotcha. Yeah. So the 
the question I put out a few questions in the in the Facebook group, and I won't I won't uh, like reread everybody's, but some of sure. them were pretty pretty good. Uh, surrounding that the that topic in particular. Now, right. why? I know, and I'm sure you get this from everyone, from players to other right. pedal builders to right. whoever. How right. come you can't scale up so that it's less than a couple year wait time? Right. Why, why would you a, not do that? There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> one reason, which I think somebody answered on, on your post, is because I don't want to get too big. I don't want to have 20 employees. Um, it's, it's, it's too much of a hassle. Um, my shipping guy, I don't want to have another, have to have another shipping guy. I don't want to have to have another repair guy to keep all these pedals running. But even more important than that is the, the parts we use in the King of Tone were, were all discontinued like a decade ago. The, the diodes we use, the capacitors we use. So those are finite. Um, if I had a company crank, crank these things out like crazy, they, that would be it. They, they would be done. I, I, yeah, I could use different diodes. I could use different different capacitors but is, is it the same um i don't know people people complain when you change knobs on a pedal <laughs> they want, <laughs> you know they want to get they want to get what they know and they they like um so that's another reason is that the parts are parts are, are finite okay that's those are the those are the reasons that I've theorized for years. It's it's weird being right. I'm usually wrong. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's and that's I mean, exactly. I just assumed that like he's like he's got his business to a point where he where everyone's happy, and yeah. and 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 a lot of people don't realize that scaling up is really hard. Like it's a difficult thing to do. And yeah, you know, like you said, you, have you scale up for something that has limited resources, like you're talking about. Mm. Well, eventually that's gone. Is the demand still going to be there when those resources are gone? Now you have these people that you have to say, sorry, go find another job, you know, type yeah. of deal. It's, it seems like the it's one of those, if it isn't broke, don't fix it type of situations. Yeah. I don't like that. I mean, my, my, my guys have been here, you know, I, I still, I still think of my guys as kids, but I mean, these guys are in their forties, um, maybe even fit maybe even getting close to 50, some of these guys. And, you know, they've been here. Some of these guys have been here like almost 20 years working here. And, you know, I, I like to treat my guys well. We got, we got health insurance and decent salaries. And we go out for taco Wednesdays because everyone else does taco Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, and I like to just kind of keep it, keep it under control. And I, I work way too much. I work like 80, 78 hours a week. And, uh, it's killing me. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, even though I thought I'd have a little more free time now, <clears throat> as you may know, um, my, my wife who built all of our chorus pedals and compressor pedals for years and years and years, uh, she passed away in January after almost a decade of, of fighting cancer. And in the last year I, I spent as much time taking care of her going to hospitals and spending time at hospitals than I did at work. But somehow I, I kept the business going and I, I would like to thank all of the customers who, who stood by us. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't make people wait crazy times for orders. I, so I don't know how I did it, but I managed to kind of keep the business going. Um, but I would like to, to help to thank everyone for their support because it was really, really tough time, um, trying to keep things going. But, you know, we got through that and now I thought, okay, now maybe I can cruise a little bit, but maybe it's due to, backed up work. I'm, I still don't have a life yet. Um, I'm still working way too much and not being able to relax yet. I'm trying to get back to my hobbies. Um, I've always, she always let me play tennis. Even when she was in the hospital, um, she knew how much tennis meant to me and she loved tennis too. So she wanted me, so I, I play tennis a lot. I mean, I'm on about nine different teams. Well, um, yeah, I also, you know, playing the band as you know, and I also, I'm a car fanatic. I have a whole lot of crazy sports cars and race cars that I, I love to work on myself. Although I have in the past just had a team that took care of my car and they would transport it to races all around the country. And I would just fly in and, and drive it and race it. And that's fun. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a DIY kind of guy. I want to go in there. Like last weekend I went up to the track and unfortunately I spent uh, about 16 hours in the rain, in the cold, rebuilding carburetors and 
and cleaning up my, my fuel cell and trying to get my car to run to no avail. So now my car is all apart again. But anyway, I, I'm, what I'm trying I know to that say, pain. I do know that pain. I understand <laughs> okay. what you're talking about. Yeah. So I'm trying to say in all that mess is that I, I have a very busy, complicated life. And, um, of course, analog man is the, is the main part of it, but you know, I do all this other stuff to, to keep busy and to keep my head head straight so that I, I can get away. And there's nothing better than strapping yourself in a race car and, uh, once I know my car is set and I'm strapped in and I'm on the grid, I actually get so relaxed. I've actually fallen asleep on the grid with race cars driving all around me and having to be wake up because, you know, ready to go on the track. So that, that's how comfortable I am in race cars. Wow. <laughs> and that's you a, don't that's think, nice don't think about anything else. You don't think, I don't think about business. I don't think about family or anything. It's just because your, your life is really on the line and uh, I'm very competitive individual and i really want to want to do as well as i can every race um so racing to me i find is, is a great getaway that is a that is a nice segue into one of the other questions that uh, kyle wood asked which he didn't really ask about a question so much as he just said get him to talk about his his vintage porsches so <laughs> i know this is supposed to be a guitar podcast but I think I think it's a big enough part of your life that that would be a worthy segue. And I am a former mechanic myself, so I won't be completely uh, inept to talk to you about this awesome. stuff. But well, you know what? I find there's a huge crossover in gearheads who like uh, musical instruments and who like cars and motorcycles and things. Gearhead is a gearhead, as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah, and definitely. If, and one one thing that I kind of discovered, I don't know. It's, Within the last few months or so, I, I realized ever since I was too young to remember, I liked things that are loud. When I was two years old, my favorite thing in the world was the, the mowmower man, the guy who, who pushed the lawnmower around our apartment. That was just so cool to me. Anytime he came, I would just go outside and just watch him. I guess it was because of the sound, the sound of that engine and the smell of that <laughs> oil and, and gasoline. Wow, and that's a, that's amazing. And then rock bands. It was a, 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 when I was a little kid. There was a in the '60s. You know, every every other house had a rock band, and the guys across from our house, man, they played loud. That was just so cool. And then I got to see a band when I was in middle school play, and it was so loud. I just couldn't believe it. It was just fantastic. And that's the cars, the uh, the guitars, um, the music. All that stuff, I think a little volume has to do with a little bit the racing. <laughs> I don't know. The, the sound pressure levels get your blood pumping or something. It does. I don't know. It definitely does. It does. Um, so the question about my car, yeah. So I actually, um, I actually have been been uh, interested in cars when when I got to college. Actually, even in high school, I had I had like my first car was a Triumph GT6, um, which I got for like. Two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Fixed it up and sold it for four hundred and fifty dollars. Um, I had uh, other uh, other sports cars and muscle cars back then. But when I got to college, I realized um, I had a, a, an AMC Javelin three hundred and ninety Mark Donahue, which was great in a straight line. But this little guy in this Porsche nine hundred and fourteen was killing me on the autocross course. So I was like, hmm, I got to look into getting a Porsche. And so I got one for like I don't know twelve hundred dollars when I was in high school. It was rusty restored it painted it got it running really good and i competed in that for several years sold that got a Datsun z fixed that up competed with it finally when i got my first real job after college i saved my money by living at home and uh as soon as i saved up enough money i bought a 911 s on uh, 1972 which i took to two sec national championships i worked on it all myself set it up drove it and uh sold it just before they were worth 10 times now it's worth you know, more 10 times more than I sold it for. But you know, my time has never been, never been very good. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. That is the way that the, the cookie crumbles sometimes. Yeah, so what's well, your, what's your number one racer now? Well, I, 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 the one I was working on last week is a 73, nine Uh, it's a Carrera RS other than in one, one serial number on the, on the, um, serial number plate makes it worth about seven hundred thousand dollars less but that's okay nobody has to see that <laughs> um, 
So uh, I've been racing that one since the late 90s and built it up from a, it was kind of just like a driver's ed kind of a track car when I got it. But I made it into a, a full-fledged uh, vintage race car, very safe. And uh, it's not particularly fast in a straight line, but it, it's set up very well, handles very well. And other than <clears throat> my neglect in the last two years, it's been very reliable. And I really enjoy racing it, even though I also have a... Um, a GT3 Cup, which is the factory race car that races along with the Formula One circuit, and they race at uh, Daytona and Le Mans and all that. And um, that car's a lot of fun, but um, needs an engine. And the last few years, I haven't had chance to to work on it, so that one just sits in the shop. And it all comes back to this one guy in a Porsche who was able to, or Porsche. I, yeah. I always say Porsche, and I know that's not right. Yeah, it doesn't I, matter. I, but, in England, they say it like that, and we're supposed to say Porsche. I mean, that's a German pronunciation, but it doesn't matter. I can never keep it straight. It was Porsche for so long, I'm just like, Porsche. But I know yeah. better. I know better. Right. Um, but but it's uh, is it, it all comes back to that one guy? What, what kept you? Yeah, in pretty much. Uh, I just thought, I always thought that they were cool, and um, it took the world. Uh, a lot longer than I did to think they were cool. I, I knew they were cool back in the, you know, in the eighties and nineties and I loved them. And now, you, now I can't afford them anymore because you know, that the car that I bought for, uh, for, for 20 grand, um, you know, if it, and then put so much money into it to make it a race car, if it had just stayed stock, it would not be worth a hundred grand. And everybody wow. realizes how, how, how cool they were and just how unique they are. The air cooled engine, the sound of it, the smell of it, the way they work. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's a handmade vehicle. It's not, it's not, a, there's no robots. That's, that's one of my, my things is no robots. And, uh, the Porsche 911s up till 1999, there was no robots. They were all made by hand. Oh, I didn't realize it went that long. That's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Wow. So somebody did bring up the no robots thing. Uh, <laughs> Mac Himes brought up the no robots thing. And in, in his estimation, I, some of these I summer, I kind of summarize, but in his estimation, he says the robots can do these builds, uh, pedals and things like that um, with more consistency and accuracy and, and more efficiently. And I can kind of see where he's going with that. What is your take on that for what you do? Well, first of all, we, uh, differentiate our pedals from most of the pedals that you see being made nowadays by any company of, of reasonable size in that our pedals still use the old parts that have been proven to sound good, uh, the old capacitors, chips, um, everything. And uh, I do think that they sound better. A robot cannot really assemble those kind of those kind of things. All robots can do is assemble the the new, like the surface mount components, really. Um, and uh, so that there's a couple of reasons, you know, for the sound and also for you just can't. A robot can't, wouldn't be able to assemble our pedals. The other thing is, most of the pedals you buy these days, I'm not saying that they're bad, but <clears throat> when you have these robotically manufactured pedals, everything is attached to the circuit board. All the little components are glued on there, and then uh, the solder is flowed on there and they're all soldered very nicely potentiometers and jacks everything the switch is all on the on the board um, so it's like one unit but if something breaks say a potentiometer breaks they don't use the kind of potentiometers you can usually just go out and buy and replace everything's attached to the board the jacks are attached to the board and the switches we do that on, on some of our things too but at least ours you can pull them out and change them you can buy all, any any part that gets broken on our pedals, you can buy that part from Small Bear Electronics or Mammoth or Foresight, whatever they're called these days. We don't use proprietary parts, whereas other pedals, you know, in the old days, you'd have, you know, your DOD, um, their later pedals, they were all proprietary parts. A switch or a jack or something broke on a, a DOD FX something pedal, it was garbage. You couldn't replace them. Mm -hmm. But they were only $30 pedals. But now you see these, these companies that are I'm not going to use the word boutique, but you know, those kind of companies and their pedals are pretty much like, the, like the $30 DOD pedals from the nineties, except they're charging $200 for these things, which to me, okay, if I'm going to robotically make a pedal and use all these parts and stuff, I wouldn't feel right selling it for $200 because they're that, they're much, that much cheaper to reproduce. 
And if they break, you can't really fix them. They're kind of disposable. Uh, people, pe people can disagree with me on that, but that, that's, that's really how I feel about them is, you know, you get what you pay for. And uh, I don't think you should pay $200 for a pedal that is that, of that build quality. <laughs> that's just okay. the way I feel about it. <laughs> okay. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. All right, let's see. I'm going to dig in here for some more. There's a lot of questions. I'm not going to be able to go through all of them. But um, uh, Andrew Renard, who actually has his own podcast called uh, Get Offset. So there's a little plug for you. Oh. But uh, the uh, he I'll, I'll read this one. This one's this one's good. The legacy that Cesar Diaz has left on the pedal industry uh, decades after his passing. My understanding is that Mike knew him before his passing and not enough younger players have any idea who he was or what he contributed to the foundation of what we now know as boutique gear. Can you speak on that point at all? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I really do miss Caesar and boy, he would, he would really, he would, he, he would never hold back. Um, he was very honest and, and if he would call a spade a spade and he, he saw some of the stuff that's going on in our industry right now. I mean, he was, I, I don't want to, mention the names but there was boutique <clears throat> companies back then that would kind of copy some of his ideas and stuff and he would just go off the deep end on them and uh, <laughs> the, the stuff that they did back then is nothing like the cutthroat things that you, you see done in our industry today where people just blatantly copy and rip off and and and, and lie that the lies have just the lies started in this business and they're just growing and growing but that's another thing but caesar was great because he he was very strong individual um although you know he he did fight off uh, he did have one transplant um and he lived lived a while after that but when when it came time for the second transplant he didn't want to go through it again so um he didn't want to put his family and and all of th through that again so he he bowed out gracefully but um when he was around we i actually met him at that first guitar show where i became analog man at the uh the classic american guitar show in long island and um most people a lot of people hated him but i i tr treat him at like like everybody at least originally or actually i I've tried to treat everyone with respect i treated him with a lot of respect because i knew who he was i knew who he worked with and so we started working together um i was one of his first dealers for his pedals and he would bounce ideas off of me with uh you know his texas ranger which is like our range master or his square face fuzz which is like our sun face his tremadillo um which is the, which is two-speed tremolo and uh like I, I i i would spend a lot of time in japan and reading their guitar magazines and stuff and i found someone over there who was um ripping him off and I brought it to his, his attention and um, he got his, his lawyers and people involved in that because they were selling things as Diaz that had nothing to do with him. And to thank me, he gave, he sent me like his box of Fender amplifier transformers, which for me was fantastic because I was buying and selling vintage guitar amplifiers at the time. And um, he was selling them to people for overseas and taking out the Amer American transformers and the extra ones. So he was just a really nice guy to me. He, he gave, we, we had a good give and take relationship and, uh, um, he, we had a benefit concert for him to try to raise money. Um, it's really sad to lose him because he would, he was, he would just, I would just love to see what he would be doing today and how he would be dealing with, with the things that are happening in this industry, <laughs> whose asses he would be kicking. <laughs> <laughs> you, you think he might have something to say about, you know, gooped uh wah pedals and <laughs> things like that that might be a oh, thing that he yeah. would have all, some notes on all kinds of things all kinds of things and it, you just didn't want to get on his bad side let me put it that way you did not want to piss him off because he would let you have it <laughs> <laughs> let's see let's see what else we have there's there's a lot of stuff some of which we've already we've already touched on in in one way or another um Let's see. Here we go. Oh yeah, there's a good one. Dustin Babitsky. He wants to know what do you feel is your most un like underappreciated pedal that you make? That's a good question. Um, I feel a lot of them are kind of underappreciated because we don't really don't push them. But um, lately, like I, I did, I did a post about um, Astrotones recently, and uh, it drummed up some interest. And I got a lot of replies that 
people people said it was their secret weapon and uh how much they loved it for for random things and then for example um i went to see experience hendrix about a month ago and uh i brought a few pedals out there and i got to meet um uh Dweezil Zappa, and he was like, yeah, I'd like to check out your Astrotone. So I said, hmm, okay, that's an excellent, it's a weird choice. So I put it down on his pedal board, and he is so intelligent about musical sounds, uh, effects, all that kind of thing. He's just, just an intelligent guy. It was just fantastic seeing him put it through his rig, because he, he also uses the, um, the digital modeling um, amplifiers with, like, uh, PA speakers basically for his guitar amp and boy did it have some punch it sounded great and he was trying it with different different like his with his wah pedal because all his pedals have to work with his wah and he was using different settings and he was so meticulous he found between like 10 30 and 11 on the tone knob was the exact frequency he wanted he said that's the one I can use and um so now I gave him that pedal I hope to hope to hear him using it and then another guy who who just started using that pedal is a guy I've known for several years, Connor Kennedy, who, um, after I met him, he started playing as, as part of a backup band with, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, Steely Dan, Don, uh, Donald Fagan. Mm -hmm. And Donald Fagan kind of hired Connor's band as his backing band just to do some kind of solo shows and stuff. And then Connor, now Connor is actually a member of Steely Dan. He's out playing in Las Vegas. And Connor, I said, Connor, what other pedals do you want to try? And he's like, well, I, I need the compressor. And uh, can I try the Astrotone? I, th I th thought that was kind of an odd, odd idea, but sent it out to him. And he sends me this clip, which I've posted on, on my Facebook page, of him playing uh, like My Old School and a few other songs using my juicer compressor through the Astrotone with his Telecaster and it just sounds phenomenal. Nobody would think it was an Astrotone fuzz. It just lets the sound of the Telecaster with all of its squealy goodness and the, the squish from the juicer compressor just sounded phenomenal. And I had never even thought of, and I play some of those Steely Daunt Dan songs and I've never thought of using the Astrotone, although I do use the <laughs> juicer compressor. Um, but now I'm feeling, you know, the Astrotone, I think, is probably underappreciated because it can do so many things. I, I, I kind of just use it as a, a rhythm crunch box for like 70s crunch with my Les Paul. But boy, it can do so much more than that. That's 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 a good answer. That's not the one I would have picked. I would have, <laughs> I would have guessed I would have guessed maybe like your analog delay, your dual dual analog delay or something. That's yeah. that kind of came out of nowhere. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, but that, the Astrotone, it was all this came out, you know, within the last few weeks, all of this stuff. So that's kind of, but I, I do feel it's kind of underappreciated and um, it's, it's a cool pedal. I'm going to start using mine more. I'll tell you that right now. Nice. Very cool. So actually, you mentioned something way back that I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about and that kind of ties in with this question uh, from Sean Wright from, uh, from Lollygagger FX, who's been on the show before. Hmm. Um, his question is, is this the last of the great NOS transistors? Like everyone's been saying, or just like crude oil, Ooh. there's more out there than everyone yeah. thinks. And there's... then I want to, I want to add something to that, yeah. which is, uh, a kind of a double up on that question, which is you worked for a company that specialized in testing transistors. Right. Uh, what, so my, my kind of uh, second part of that would be, what did you see then that, that makes these things special or unique in some way. Okay. Well, try to remind me if I forget the second part, but the first part, there's definitely a finite number of actual non fake good, you know, for example, the NK2275 transistors, every, everybody kind of knows the story. These were the only transistors that were used in 99% of the original run of Dallas Arbiter fuzz faces up until around 1969. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they just sounded good for that circuit. They were, they could get very clean. They had a nice tone. Um, and they, they're pretty consistent. And uh, I was actually lucky to be able to find a bunch of those way back. I think RG Keen actually sold me a bunch of them back in the, in the early nineties or mid nineties. I went through those really fast and I found a supplier in, uh, 
in Europe, and this was still before the internet. I don't even know how I found them, but um, bought a bunch from them, which were the what we called the white dot NKTs, which are nice and clean, very consistent, low leakage. We used a lot of those in Beano Boost. There's one on eBay now that's like five four hundred and fifty dollars for our Beano Boost just because it has that transistor in it, which I find kind of ridiculous. Um, so those NKT, then we ran out of those. We, I don't know, we made, made, made a thousand or a couple thousand of those. Then we, then we found the red dot NKT transistors in Europe. Um, I made probably, I don't know, three, 3,000, 4,000 of those using those transistors and recently found, um, a, a bag that were tested as bad. I posted up on, on uh, Facebook and Instagram that I found those and I'm going to retest those and I should be, probably be able to make another batch of, of, uh, of red dot NKT two seven five with these They're They might have a little more leakage than we would normally use back then. So they might not be exactly the same, but I think they'll sound fine. But I had in the last decade, every NKT two seven five I've found in quantities of more than one or two has been, a blatant fake and oh, wow. uh, okay. some of them i mean if you look at ebay the, the ones that have like a top hat rims the skinny ones with the top hats those will never sound not only the fake but they just don't sound good and a lot of people will say oh well as long as the transistor has the same characteristics it has the same leakage the same gain um all, all those things it's going to sound the same well they don't you can have two transistors with exact same uh, characteristics that sound completely different. I've got piles and piles of transistors here that I just won't use because that model of transistor or that batch, they just don't sound good. They're either grainy. Uh, um, what I listen for in transistors is the harmonics. I can, I can just get the transistors, put them in my circuit, bias them up so that I know they should sound right, and just scratch the guitar strings. And I'll, I'll usually know within five seconds if these are going to be useful because they don't have the harmonic content. A good sound to me, you've got to have, you know, all the all the various harmonics to get that sweet tone that you want to hear so it lets all of your guitar pickups through. And that's not a characteristic you can measure with an instrument. You have to use your ears. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I can definitely understand that. I feel I feel like you know, I'm not a builder. I'm just I've talked to a lot of them. Uh play one on TV sometimes. <laughs> uh but I I've always kind of thought like something like a, a for most resistors, right? Like yeah. A resistor is kind of a resistor. If, as long as it measures what it's supposed to do, that's Pretty what much. it does. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people who will say that, you know, changing one resistor in their Dumble amp is going to change the tone. And I've got guys who, who swear to me that it does. You have to have the, the, the correct resistors in your Dumble clone or it's not going to sound like a Dumble. And, um, but, you know, that's only certain parts of the circuit maybe or, I mean, we, we try to use the carbon comp resistors where we can, where where they'll work, because that's what they use in the old ones. People like the sound of the old ones. Our ears are tuned. I mean, the reason we like the sound of a 59 Les Paul is because we heard those on so many fantastic recordings and albums, and that's what our ears are tuned to. Yeah, and that's, that's, well, that's why, a good point. And that's why I use the parts I use, because our ears are tuned to like those parts. The Philips capacitors I use, I... I get these Philips capacitors from all around the world in small batches because they stopped making them years ago. And I still use them because maybe they sound a little different. They have the characteristic that we're used to hearing that we that we like. <laughs> Good mm -hmm. or bad, we like it. <laughs> <laughs> has there um, ever been anything in this business since you've been doing it for so long? Has it, what is like the coolest thing that has happened to you or, or most interesting thing or something that stands out to you? It is in what what area? I don't. Uh, just uh, just kind of in the music business that we're in in general. Well, the cool well the coolest thing that's happened happened to me. Um, I don't know if these are questions, but when somebody who's really like an idol of mine just goes onto my website and orders a pedal without asking questions or or asking for any any special handouts or. They just they know my compressor sounds good, so they go on my website and order a compressor, and they haven't they don't have their agent or their tech or a friend order it or try to get it for free. They just order it. I think that's cool. Oh yeah, that <laughs> if somebody cool. does that, they really get my respect. 
They're, you, come on, if you just give it to me, I will pay you in exposure dollars. <laughs> don't worry about it. It'll be fine. It'll exactly. Be fine. But they don't need, you know, they, they have the money. They don't need, you know, to, to ask. They just, hey, I want the pedal. I'm going to buy it. So that, that, yeah. that, that's cool. That, that I wasn't really expecting to see some, some of the names that have, have done that. And they, you know, they know I, I don't, I'm not a kiss and tell kind of guy. If, right. if you don't, if you, if you don't give me permission to say, actually one of, one of the world's most famous guitarists is using a thing of tone down. I can't even tell you who he is because I, I, I sent him one and I said, well, can I add him to the page? And he, he was, his, his uh, tech was, well, no, he doesn't like to, to, uh, to do that. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I'm just hoping huh? somebody sees on his pedal board. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it's going to help me sell more King of Tones. I don't need to sell more King of Tones, but it makes me feel good. It makes validates my my work when I see somebody who I idolize, who I feel has some of the greatest tones, some of the greatest songwriting using one of my pedals. That's why I do this. Yeah, it makes I, I do this to, to to feel good. Yeah, I mean, I'm not doing this for money anymore. I could make I could make money selling hot dogs. It would be a whole lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves hot dogs. That's, exactly, they sell themselves. They sell themselves. <laughs> Just like a king of tone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The king of tone does oh, does boy. kind of perpetuate itself. But right. well, man, this has been great. Thanks for hanging out. I got a couple more questions. Uh, kind of the the stock questions, as they were. Sure. And, one of these, I think, I don't know, I'm wondering if you've ever been asked this before. What is your favorite boss pedal? Oh, that is a good question. I do, I, I am a huge fan of the old, older boss pedals, the original size ones, and the, the larger AC powered, like the CE ones and, and those things. Um, what's my favorite boss pedal? Boy, um, that's a good question. I mean, the OD1 is just such such an iconic pedal because it was kind of the first what well, I consider of the modern overdrives. I used to buy and sell a ton of those for Japan. The Boss Spectrum is kind of a cool pedal. It's kind of a filtery thing. Um, the the uh, that slow gear, that reverse pedal is very cool. The CE1, I mean, yeah, the CE1 is just incredible, although it doesn't really work good on guitar without our modifications, hint, hint. But um, <laughs> wink, wink. C E yeah, C E one. That, that's that's got to be my favorite boss pedal, even though I don't use one because they're so huge. And I, our our, our chorus to me sounds fantastic. But I, probably the C E one would be my favorite boss pedal. All right, good answer, good answer. And I I feel like you're going to be really passionate about this one, just strictly based on the area that you live in. And that would be the classic tone mob question: What is your favorite kind of pizza? Yeah, we have a lot of good pizza in this area. Um, I mean, in Newtown, we have this place called, I can't even pronounce it, but they're supposed to be one of the best. And Pepe's Pizza in New Haven has <clears throat> has been named the best pizza in the country a lot. And in the last, I think around five years ago, Pepe's moved to Danbury when they're probably about two miles from my shop. Of course, you have to drive 10 miles to get there because of our lousy highway system here. But um Peppy's pizza is pretty damn good, but any any wood fired pizza of that type, I don't like a I don't like the thin crust. I like you know a decent sized crust. I do like the fresh the fresh uh, tangy sauce. Uh, maybe maybe a little pepperoni or or peppers, but something like that. Peppy's uh, brick oven pizza is my favorite kind of pizza. Very cool. Any particular toppings that that scratch the itch for you? Yeah, a little pepperoni, uh, roasted peppers. Um, also, I like salad pizza. I've got a place next door to my shop, Rizzuto's, and boy, their salad pizza is good. You just put a chopped salad on top of a, a plain vanilla pizza, and that's fantastic. That I didn't see coming. I don't think I've ever heard that answer before. <laughs> it's good, but no, the, just the classic Pepe's a pizza, starting with the, they don't use the, the letter A up here, but down in New Haven, you'll see a lot of the pizzerias have the, the A in front of pizza. Oh, right. A pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever that means. We've got one. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm not sure either. We've only got one that I can think of around here that does the A. Everyone else is kind of abandoned yep. that vowel. Right. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was really great. I had a really great, good time talking to you. I feel like I could go all day. But uh, well, Thank you. Yeah, it could. I mean, I can't believe we're done already. I thought we were just getting started. That's, how this, <laughs> that's generally how this show works, for sure. But if there's anything you want to plug, anybody you want to shout out, anything you want to say, now is a great time. Uh, just uh, Again, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, for sticking with us and keeping it real and uh, – you know, just um, I just like everyone to to think about you know the sounds rather than having a million knobs on a pedal and three light bulbs and jelly beans and things. You know, the the, the reason to have a pedal is because the sound. Think about getting one pedal that has one really good sound rather than a pedal that has two hundred mediocre sounds. How about that? Ah, that's not a bad way to think. I like it. <laughs> And that way you can get more pedals too. <laughs> <laughs> you can get 20 of the best sounding pedals ever. Instead exactly. Of one. And then, yeah. and then we can get our gig rig G2 switcher system and then you'll have everything. Yeah. You'll be dialed in. Everything will right be gravy. All right, man. Well, thanks for doing this. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So for Mike, this is Blake. And as always folks, good luck and good tones. And that was that was awesome. A true legend in the business and a legendary human being as well. That was a really fun chat. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. I enjoyed every single second of it. And if you need more of that exact same thing, we've got more on Patreon, like I said at the top of the show. So if that was a, that was just everything you needed in life, you can go to patreon.com slash tone mob and we have more of this exact same conversation for you. So for as little as $5 a month, you can get extra Tone Mobbery beamed right to your favorite podcast player. I do it every week. I give you extra content, extra conversation, extra just audio pleasure. I don't know. Or maybe torture. I'm not sure which it is. But either way, if it's for you, it's available over there. And thank you guys so much. If you could share this with just one person, that would just make my whole life because without the without the listeners, this show is absolutely nothing. So thank you for sticking around this long. Thank you for, you know, everything, honestly. It's all about you guys at the end of the day. I couldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you. So thank you all so much. I got more lined up for you next week. But until then, have a good one. Bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here, I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.